Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. Uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon as we bring you the latest lecture for our Cubby Lecture Series. This afternoon, I'm pleased to present our speaker today, Dr. Ronald Jackson. He's a renowned author, wine writer, and has been a Covey Fellow since we started the Fellow uh, Program uh, here at the Institute. Ronald attained his uh, PhD from the University of Toronto, where he specialized in the physiology of botrytis. And it was during one of his sabbaticals at Cornell University that he truly expanded his interest to cover uh, various aspects of the full spectrum of enology and viticulture. Since then, he's been a technical advisor to the Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries Corporation, given countless wine appreciation courses, and started a wine tasting uh, society. But it is perhaps uh, what he's best known for uh, are his uh, textbooks in the uh, grape and wine uh, field. Most recently, his um, uh, uh, book uh, called Wine Tasting, a professional handbook, uh, won the 2017 Discovering and Presenting Wine Award at the OIV. Um, something that uh, he wanted to, to share with uh, uh, many of the students out there. Uh, this was quite impressive. Uh, because in addition to all Ron does, he suffers from dyslexia. And he just wanted to, uh, you all to know that uh, um, there are ways to uh, overcome these sorts of challenges. And uh, he is certainly uh, true to that testament. He has now accepted early retirement, which he says will allow him to more fully focus on his writings. So uh, we're, we'll have you back when uh, all the next books uh, come out as well, Ron. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jackson as he shares his lecture on the intricacies of court closures and their alternatives. Oh, thank you very much. It's fun to be back again. Uh, up in front of people, and uh, uh, well, I, I do do a bit more of that than I have recently since uh, at the condo, uh, people, when they realized that I knew something about wine, uh, they wanted me to get wine appreciation courses, I did those, and then they said, oh, well, gee whiz, uh, well, why don't you just start to give uh, monthly wine tasting, so, so I'm doing that, and all sorts of things. Oh, okay. Uh, to cork or not to cork, uh, apologies to Shakespeare, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, in reality the, the question is more uh, what should a closure actually do uh, and uh, what are the ideal characteristics. In the past it was not really a question because you only had cork, so that, that, that was it. And, uh, but with all the current options, uh, now you have to start to say, well, uh, why should I use one versus another? So what are the advantages? Well, what does, well, essentially all the options will do certain things reasonably well, at least for a couple of years. Uh, they tend to protect the wine from excessive exposure to oxygen. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, it keeps out bugs, it keeps out dust, uh, and it also limits the rate at which sulfur dioxide escapes from the wine. Uh, it also um, slows the escape of carbon dioxide. Uh, that's pretty important if you have a sparkling wine, because carbon dioxide does get out. And uh, then you have fat-soluble aromatics, uh, which are the nice pleasant aromas that, that you could find in the wine, then they, they will slowly escape too. So, so uh, the, those are the uh, basic requirements. But beyond that, uh, what do people want? Well, if you're uh, the buy and drink uh, type of person, then basically that's all you really need because uh, the, the wine's probably not going to be more than two years old when you get it, and so it'll be fine, and so you, um, that's all you really need. It's preserved at least for that period. Uh, but then you also have uh, some secondary things like, uh, is it easy to get 
the closure open or out or whatever? And is it comparatively easy to reseal, assuming you don't consume all the wine all one shot? Oh, okay. Um, for the winemaker, then you have other issues that, that, that you're getting down to the nitty gritty of economy, uh, cost benefit ratio. And uh, it can be part of the image uh, that you as a winery, uh, winemaker want to present. Now, court has the advantage of tradition. So, so uh, that's a good thing if for certain people, they, they want tradition. Uh, they, it also can give a person a sense of this wine has higher prestige, higher quality than, than something that is screw cap or something. And uh, looking down the nose of the screw cap. And of course, um, uh, there is the ritual of actually tricking the cork out. Some people like that. They like the pop. Uh, if you have a screw cap, no pop. Ah, oh, my, my, my. Well, what you're missing. Uh, and then the environments that they, they look at and say, okay, well, of all these options, uh, which one's the best from that point of view? Well, uh, cork is renewable. It's a natural product. It's renewable. It's biodegradable, albeit somewhat slowly. Uh, and, then, and then you have, uh, say, um, the glass stopper. Now, I'll talk about that later. Uh, the screw cap. Uh, it, it has a large carbon footprint. Glass takes a lot of energy to make. Okay. And uh, aluminum to extract it from uh, ore is also very energy expensive. But it is recyclable. Uh, even if it, glass has to be ground up and used in pavement or something. And uh, that, then you have plastic, comparatively inexpensive, easily moldable. You can easily change its color, and uh, but whether it's recyclable or not, yeah, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, one advantage of all the newer closures is that it's a man-made product, manufactured. That means you have quality control, uh, and you have far more quality control over uh, these newer products than you're ever going to have with court at least up to the moment, uh, still cork is a variable product. It's a natural product, you get natural variation. Uh, more intractable, uh, when you cover all these issues, uh, is what do you really want to keep out and what do you want to keep in? And how much? Uh, people talk about oxygen. Well, Ideally, you want a little bit in, theoretically at least. Uh, at least normally, you think you want a little bit in. Uh, it helps to stabilize color. Uh, it may produce some changes in the air, aromatics in there, which are good. Um, but it can also lead to fragrance degradation. And uh, it also limits microbial uh, degradation. Uh, if you have too much oxygen, then uh, certain microbes that are in there, even though there's a little bit, uh, they can actually start to grow. Uh, the acetic acid bacteria actually can use minute amount. And so, so depending on how much gets in, uh, you could actually have some microbial de decomposition, but usually the amount getting in is so low that uh, basically you can kind of forget about it. Uh, you want to retain the sulfur dioxide for at least a number of years. Eventually it will go though. It escapes through the core. It'll escape through basically anything other than maybe uh, a glass stopper. And uh, so it starts to go. And of course it reacts with other compounds in the wine. Uh, but if you uh, hold too much oxygen out and the sulfur stays in, then you may also develop a reduced sulfur odor. And that's negative. So, so you've got good and bad, almost in every side, uh, you want that ideal. And reduced 
sulfur odor, well, what do we describe it as? Well, various people have various terms. Some people say it smells like shrimp, which some people like, I suppose. And uh, cabbage or rotten cabbage or rotten eggs, okay, that, that's hydrogen sulfide, that's pretty uh, unpleasant. But actually in small amounts, it actually is pleasant. Very, very small. Uh, small enough that you don't even recognize what it is. <laughs> and uh, then you have struck flint, and that's another one that they, they say may be part of this whole conundrum of uh, reduced odors. Uh, I mentioned that you want to retain the carbon dioxide, especially for uh, your sparkling wine. Uh, usually it does a pretty good job for quite a few years, but uh, uh, Leger Bel Air in uh, Rand. Uh, he's done some studies on it and it does go down. But uh, when I was looking at his graphic, because sadly I, I didn't decide to put it in, should have. Uh, but, anyways, uh, most of his, he only has a couple of data points and he projected it through physics as to what would happen with time. Uh, and, uh, interesting, and uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I had a chance to try a nice old champagne that was about 20 years old, and so I thought, well, gee, was there hardly going to be any bubbles yet in this one. In fact, there were a lot, uh, the, not as much as usual, but uh, so, so his predictions, uh, based on this graph, actually didn't fit that particular bottle. But other ones I've tried, yeah, yeah, it, it's lost. And then, then you also have um, winemaker's desires. Uh, what particular style uh, is intended? Uh, the cultivar will make a difference. Uh, some are more susceptible to reduced odors than others. Uh, consumers' ideas and intentions. Okay, closure options. Uh, in the 750 ml bottle, okay, we'll talk about that one because that's the one most people know about. Uh, the width that uh, you will want in your cork is typically 24. That, that, that fits the, the normal size of uh, the, the neck. Though uh, some corks do come at 22 and get up to 26. Uh, well, what's the advantage of having a little Thicker one, well, of course, more compression when you go into the bottle. Because the, the neck of the bottle is about kind of around 22, uh, uh, where, where if you put 24, then it means you have two millimeters of compression. If you put a 26 in, then you have four millimeters of compression. And so presume it, and I'll show you a graph. Gra that shows that actually compressed cork does reduce the rate at which gas flows through. Uh, how long would one light? Well, standard is uh, 45 millimeters long. Some short corks, uh, if you start collecting corks, you'll find some that are short, and that they tend to be about 40. Uh, that then you get the really long ones, uh, that they go up to about 55. Uh, you would basically want to use uh, a long cord uh, for a wine that you expected your consumer to age for the next 20, 25, 30 years. Uh, because the cork does corrode. It is not impermeable to all those acids in the wine. And it does corrode and it corrodes, uh, loses its elasticity, in other words, uh, from the inside outwards. And, uh, uh, and then we have quality of cork. Well, when you get to quality of cork, uh, you get in a, a number of interesting issues, uh, at least from the botanical point of view. Uh, you're talking about porosity. Uh, how many pores uh, are in the cork? And the cork's uh, pores are normally lentisols. That, that uh, in the living plant are allowing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out from the living part of the tree. And then you can have fissures. I'll show you a slide later on of 
the range of size of fissures that you can get. And part of this, the porosity, is also a function of the rate of growth of the tree. Uh, there's fast growing cork and slow growing cork. And uh, the, the faster the cork grows, that means if it grows at a regular rate, you can strip it off the tree every nine years. That's standard. If it's slow grown cork, then you have to wait 12 years, 15 years to get the same thickness. You, you have to get a certain thickness of cork before you take it off to get uh, the corks uh, of the appropriate uh, size. And uh, no, normally you talk about this, uh, that the rapid grown cork uh, are ones that are basically in the lowland of Portugal. The rapid grown ones, they're up in the highlands, it's drier. And uh, uh, if you uh, leave, when, when you pass by the displays, have a look at the cork slabs that are there. And you'll see that uh, the ones that are really thick, uh, you'll look at the thickness of the growth rings. Uh, that they're quite large. And then in the next one down, you have this narrower piece of cork, and you look and you, boy, you see lots of growth rings. Now that, that's top quality cork, because okay? you have the least amount of uh, porosity in that cork. You have more wall, less uh, lumen in, in the cell. And so it's a more spongious material. Uh, corks, as you take them out of the bottle, and even, of course, obviously, before you put them in, uh, they can be colored. Uh, the, the ones I prefer uh, are uh, the ones on the right-hand side. Uh, that's natural color. And I always would like cork that's natural color. Uh, I think it's a nice color. And, uh, uh, on the far right, uh, uh, then we have one that has been bleached somewhat to remove some of that brownish coloration. And the one in the center is the one that's been bleached a lot to basically be white. And they can actually put color, uh, and put some pinkish coloration on cork and all sorts of other oddball things. I know why people do that. Uh, I guess I'm a purist, so, so I like cork to look exactly like uh, natural stuff. And, uh, okay, uh, the lower grade corks tend to have large lenticels or fissures. And what they do is they take the cork and they actually roll it in cork dust with uh, a polyethylene glue. They rotate it, rumble it around, and then uh, it kind of fills the surface fissures and cracks and so on. And then they press it and heat it. And so at least the surface of the cork looks better and uh, is, uh, actually improves its uh, sealing quality. And of course, then you can also uh, chamfer the cork. And uh, when you take cork out of sherry or port or something of that sort, you'll see that there's that little bevel of course, that makes it easier to insert and remove. And you know, of course, uh, in those uh, types of wine, normally have a plastic top so you can get a good grip on. And uh, I know how well it shows up in, in this lesson. Let me see. Uh, ah, let me show. Yeah, you have to look very close. Uh, but th th this one is uh, number uno uh, type cork. It has about, uh, about 12 or 13 layers showing. The, the, the other ones are kind of trimmed off, but uh, no, that, that's the type of cork I like to see in my bottle, but I normally don't see it very often. Okay, um, other options, well, what are called technical corks. Technical corks are almost always, for most people, that they just call them agglomerate cork. And uh, it's made from cork chips. Uh, anything that's not used for 
natural core, you basically uh, can grind up and uh, use for a glomer core. And uh, that they uh, have this polyurethane adhesive uh, and it's pressed together, heated, and forms this solid block. It's actually pretty good stuff. And uh, the, if the chips are larger, the tent is called a glomer cork. If it's smaller, they call it micro glomer cork. But the difference is <laughs> not, not that very much. And then you have the twin top type, uh, which has a center part, which is a glomer, and you have uh, roundels or little round pieces of natural cork stuck on the top or bottom, or sometimes just on the bottom. A uh, classic example of that one is actually the champagne corks. And all that, that I've presented here are champagne corks. Uh, the one in the center is the one that you normally will see, has a glomer at the top and two discs of natural cork on the bottom. And uh, the, the one on the, uh, the right hand, that, that's actually uh, a synthetic cork. Well, yeah, oh, well, that, that one shouldn't be in there. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's a synthetic cork with a liner. And the, the, what to do with the liner, they, they actually put lines on it to make it look like the regular. <laughs> but, but the inside is phony. Uh, the, the one on uh, the, the left hand side, uh, I always had to think, well, which is right and left, because uh, one of the problems with dyslectics, uh, uh, you, you muck up left and right. Uh, but anyway, the, the one on the left, uh, that's straight agglomerate all the way through. The normal is you want to have, uh, I don't know why, uh, they want to have some natural cork next to the wine. Is it essential? I don't think so, but that, that's the way they do it. In the old days, it used to be all natural cork. But then you had to have a lot thicker piece of bark uh, to, to uh, use the, this way. Uh, the way you cut it uh, solves that problem. And of course, the bottom is what it looks like when it comes out of the bottle. So it's really uh, crushed the top uh, to get into that knobby shape. And of course, the inside uh, shows that the bottle is actually inside, goes like this a bit exaggerated as I draw it, but that, that's... Uh, then we get to uh, straight synthetic quarks, and uh, the, the one shows... Uh, initially you look at it and say, oh geez, that, that, that must be an actual cork, and there you have the little lines that are supposed to be the annual rings, but if you take a knife to it, it just shaves right off, and then, then you get... <laughs> Well, you're thinking inside. <laughs> and of course, they actually do the top. And they, they actually put some spots to, to make it look uh, like lettuce or lodge. It's a, this crazy block of what they do. But anyway, um, the, uh, there are various types of that one. Okay. Uh, and then the bottom one is another type of synthetic cord, uh, but it's all plastic, and nobody tries to hide that it isn't. Uh, the one uh, just below the uh, uh, the long one uh, with the little kind of T cork shape, that's all plastic and it actually has a spiral plastic. And so you just tear off that strip and out it comes and you get easy to reinsert. Uh, it's called a Zork cork. And the one on uh, side, which is the champagne or sparkling wine version, uh, actually damn nice. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, what it is, is uh, it has uh, a liner. This, I'll talk about liners. Uh, and uh, it's this thing. And of course, once it's out, uh, and essentially well, what you do, uh, you can save it. And you can take another champagne bottle or well, whatever you want and just put it on and force it down and it's sealed. And uh, it keeps uh, the carbon dioxide actually for a good period of time. And, uh, 
uh, if you're living alone like me now uh, and you want your sparkling wine, uh, I'm not going to drink a whole bottle of champagne in one evening, holy smokes. Uh, I don't want to kill myself. <laughs> I want to drink later on too. That's, so uh, something like this or any other type of court closure may mean you can keep your sparkling wine and have it over whole week. Uh, in fact, it's a pretty spiffy thing. Uh, Australian invention, that one. And of course, the, then we have uh, a regular screw cap. Uh, very, everybody used that one. Uh, uh, I love it too. Uh, the, the only disadvantage to the screw cap and all these other ones is it's not botanical. Uh, and so, so I'm kind of caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, I like cord uh, because it's natural, it's botanical. Well, all sort of those things. However, uh, for practicality, I have to admit that the screw cap does have a lot going for it. And uh, there are two types of liners uh, on the, the inside. And uh, if you've looked at the inside of your screw cap lately, uh, probably know what that I didn't really do much until recently myself. Uh, some have kind of a shiny layer, some are nice and white. Uh, the, there's a difference between the two. One is called Serenex, the, the one that's just white. And the one that has shiny uh, kind of metallic, that's Serotin, uh, because it actually has a tin lining. And so, so you have uh, a sponges portion uh, there's one that I took out, uh, white sponges material, which actually uh, flexes, of course, uh, when uh, the, the cap is put on, puts pressure to, to, to seal. Uh, that then you have this uh, thin layer, uh, which is actually the part that's impermeable, or pretty impermeable, uh, to gashes. And then it may have this uh, thin lining of tin on the inside, and that really does seal it pretty well. Okay, and then we get the glass stopper. Hmm, forgot to even bring my butt, but there's the picture. Uh, there, there are a few bottles on the market that, that do have the glass uh, uh, stopper. Uh, it, it works seemingly. Uh, I've not seen any published data on how effective it is to keep them oxygen out and uh, sulfur dioxide in and so on. Uh, but reports say it's supposed to be pretty good. It's glass and has this uh, silicone O-ring that uh, stays in. And of course, when you take it out, you just put it back and give it a little whack and uh, it seals again. Uh, the one disadvantage is that uh, those tend to be more expensive than any other type of closure. So it's a costly expense, but you can put your label on it and all sorts of marks and so on. And uh, then we get to this crown cap. Uh, I've never seen a bottle for sale in a, <laughs> of wine in a crown cap. Uh, apparently there are supposed to be some, but I, I've not seen any. Uh, they're used primarily in producing sparkling wines. And uh, since uh, if you're going to make it in the traditional method with uh, the second fermentation in the bottle, then uh, it's a lot less expensive to seal it with a crown cap than to put in a cork one. Because it's just going to come out and thrown away anyways, so why not use a crown cap and uh, most of the time, uh, any visitors are not going to be seeing that it has a crown cap on it. And of course, once it's disgorged and you take the yeast out, then you put uh, a regular cork in it. And, and now we get to uh, some good botany. Uh, cork origins uh, is actually a tree, a comparatively small tree. Uh, it grows in savanna-like areas, and uh, its distribution is 
predominantly Portugal, a little bit of southern Spain, uh, a little bit of France, uh, Sardinia, uh, and uh, uh, a little bit of North Africa, but about 50 to 55 percent of all core that is on the market comes from Portugal. About 23 percent from Spain and then the rest from the various areas. Uh, how long does the cork uh, tree grow? Well, it can grow up to 500 years. Uh, usually, uh, it doesn't last that long, but the really productive period for the cork oak tree is between roughly 50 years of age and to about 250 years of age. And uh, uh, they strip, start stripping when the uh, tree is about uh, diameter of such. And uh, that's when you can start to get a reasonable size of cork. And the first stripping uh, is called virgin cork. And uh, that this is uh, the piece I have. Looks pretty crummy. Uh, it's uh, lots of splits and oh, I, it, you wouldn't want to make <laughs> cork out of that. Uh, but that's the virgin cork. And then it's stripped off uh, to just outside the um, flow. It's stripped off, uh, and this stimulates new cork growth. It forms new cork cambium, producing cork, and uh, it's a little more uniform than the virgin cork. That type of cork is called second cork. And uh, the third stripping, uh, if you take off the second cork, then you start getting what's called reproduction cork. And from there on, the reproduction cork is of a comparative consistent quality and uniformity that they can make cork, uh, make stoppers out of it. Uh, they, uh, it's stripped by uh, people who do this all the time that because if you go a little too deep that then you start cutting into the flow and then you get scars that means that part of where uh, bark is going to be produced will never have the quality to make cork stoppers so that you have to be careful in how far they go in, but you want to go in far enough. And uh, they normally do the stripping in the kind of late spring or very, very early summer. Uh, this is when the tree has started to grow again, uh, producing new phloem and xylem, we all know that, but it's also producing new cork. And this new cork is that the cells are still alive. And uh, so they're moist, and so this is a weak zone. And so when you cut in, you cut up the top, the bottom, and then down the sides, and then you start to peel it off. And it splits off, ideally, at this zone of the latest cork growth of that year. And so you get it off. Uh, the slide on the side is, you, know, you can spec, uh, you see that uh, the top one is the virgin cork, then you have the second cork, and then the virgin cork is the next one down. Uh, and you can see that uh, it's getting more uniform in character. Uh, once it's been stripped off, uh, then you boil it and kind of flatten it. Okay. Uh, processing. Uh, once it's off, uh, you either it's moved to a factory or uh, still out in the savanna where, where uh, the cork trees are growing, uh, boil it and that softens it and so it flattens it a bit so they, they stack it up and they leave it outside for up to six months and uh, then certainly at some time it's going to go to the factory and then they boil it a second time most time. Again, help to flatten it a bit more and then, then we have the worker there who is a big slab of cork and he's cutting it 
into strips. Uh, well, once uh, the strips be made, and then we see the uh, slide down below, uh, where the, the guy is actually punching them out uh, on the tangential uh, to uh, the, the way the cork grows, because this way you're cutting uh, the, the lentils, which are the potentially the most porous zone, are actually when you put it in the bottle, because of the way you cut it out, the lentils are going this way. And so the most the porosity, the worst part of the, the cork, is actually against the side of the glass. And uh, generally in a 24 millimeter, uh, the, the length of the course, you have about 300, 350 cork cells. And uh, these are all dead cells. All basically you have left is the cell wall and the uh, empty inside. Uh, once they've been punched out, uh, then they tend to be surface sterilized and at least uh, depending on how much they, they leave it. And this is now uh, per acetic acid. Uh, it reacts uh, with the cork and releases peroxide. It's the peroxide that's doing the surface sterilization and uh, partial bleaching. Uh, then it's rinsed, then dried down to about five to eight percent relative humidity. Uh, it generally is coated on the surface with a little bit of paraffin uh, that, that's to uh, theoretically, they say, to replace some of the waxes that have been lost uh, during the processing procedure. And then they put on a little bit of silicone. The silicone is there to make it easier for the cork to actually get in the bottle and also somewhat easier to get it back out. And, uh, Finally, then they're sorted into grades based on the surface appearance of the porosity. And that, that's a basic grading. Uh, at the moment, there's no way of figuring out the porosity inside the cork. So basically, they do it based on the surface. Uh, they put it in the bags. They add a little bit of sulfur dioxide uh, to uh, hold back any microbial growth if there is any chance of that, then start in boxes. Uh, positive attributes of cork. Well, why is it uh, being kind of useful all these years? Uh, it's readily compressible and it doesn't bulge out at the sides. Uh, and in this case, it'd be the end that would bulge out. Uh, it's resilient, it rapidly springs back. Uh, the graph uh, there. It seems it actually starts at 85. Uh, as soon as you release the pressure, 85% is automatic spring back. And then the slow, uh, as it sits there, it slowly pushes more and more and more. So the seal becomes greater and greater. Uh, but uh, that, that's why normally uh, uh, when they, you, you fill the wine and then put the cork in, you leave it sitting upright for about a day. Uh, because the seal is not complete yet. And if there's any extra pressure inside there, that it, it can actually seep out along the sides. But uh, in one day, basically, uh, the cork is sealed against the sides of the neck. Uh, cork is generally chemically uh, impervious uh, and inert. Uh, it doesn't react with acids, but okay, short term, 25, 30 years, basically, yeah. And uh, if you happen to be lucky enough uh, to have the several cases or hundreds of cases of uh, fine Bordeaux wine that's uh, you've been aging for the past 25 and 30 years, uh, then you get your bottles recorked. So they take out the old one, put a new one in. And if you're uh, 
wealthy enough, uh, the Bordeaux producer will actually send someone to you uh, to actually uh, uncork and recork your bottles. Uh, I'm not in that class. <laughs> hey, you don't have the wine to start with. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you have slow diffusion, uh, but, but it does occur. And, and it's relatively impermeous to liquids, uh, far more impermeable to liquids than it is to gases, uh, high coefficient of friction, and the bottom of the, the A, one with the A, uh, shows a uh, cross-section of the cork cells that are basically empty cell wall. And they're like little suction cups. So we have all these suction cups pressing against the side of the bottle, uh, sealing it in there. And uh, because there are almost no nutrients in the cork that, that uh, microbes can easily degrade. That means uh, uh, pretty resistant to microbial decomposition while it's in uh, the, the bottle. Uh, fungi will grow, though, uh, in the old days uh, when you used to have the tin, uh, tin lead uh, capsules. And uh, if there's any seepage of wine out and you put that in, then fungi would start to grow on the surface of the cork. And I, I did, actually did find one, uh, that really old bottle, uh, where you could actually see the, the filaments and the penicillium had uh, actually gotten all the way down uh, to uh, the, the wine, but hadn't, as far as I could tell, but they wouldn't get any close. <laughs> uh, but that, that's not really decomposition. The penicillium is just growing through it. And with nutrients that are seeping in from the wine. Of course, what was on the top had enough to grow uh, through. Uh, the picture on uh, the right-hand side is uh, a representation of the detailed structure of the uh, cell wall. Uh, the part in the center uh, is actually the primary cell wall. And then you have the secondary cell wall with the, the black part. The, the one that's running up and down, uh, that's supposed to be a plasma desmata uh, going from one cell to another. It gets plugged uh, with callos, and uh, the layers, uh, the black is supposed to represent wax, lignin, uh, and phenols. So that, that's supposed to be representing the black. And the white is uh, suberin. And the thought is that with the super in there and these various layers, the way it's layered, uh, when pressure is exerted on the cork, it, it kind of slides and you, you get this partially wrinkled uh, appearance uh, of the cork cells. Uh, negative attributes of cork, well, uh, you can have some pretty big fissures in there. And uh, on the left-hand side, <laughs> Up at the top, uh, you see some pretty whopping big ones. And of course, as you go down, uh, the examples are smaller and smaller. And, uh, the, the, the best ones, of course, uh, on the right hand side down at the bottom. And uh, the, the graph also shows the difference in permeability of uh, cork as it exists, uh, uncompressed, and then you have. The other ones are when it's compressed the way it would be in a bottle. So the permeability uh, of the cork it goes down as it's compressed. As you would tend to expect, it'll be less permeable uh, when it's compressed, which is what you've got in uh, the bottle. Uh, okay. Uh, Potential uh, cork, of course, can be the source of, of odors occasionally. Thankfully, less so than before nowadays. Uh, you do need a corkscrew, where, whereas most of the other ones you don't. Uh, some you do, of course. Uh, there is some difficulty in reinsertion. Even if you take it out, try and get it back in, it's pretty hard to get it in. You have to do some good wax to get it back in. Uh, 
and uh, you need to lay the bottle on the side uh, because cork will dry out. And if it dries out, that means more oxygen can potentially get in. And uh, also it loses some of its resilience. Uh, and eventually, as I've said before, it will slowly degrade from the inside out uh, in contact with the ashes of the one. Uh, issues, uh, reclosure, uh, then we have taints. Uh, that's, uh, the most famous one, of course, is TCA, uh, the, the corky smell. And uh, it's a contaminant uh, associated with the previous use of uh, um, chlorinated phenols uh, in uh, as a pesticide. Uh, it was used in cork forests, uh, sprayed on trees, uh, and the principal use of spraying it on the trees, as far as I know, other than maybe some uh, bugs that were eating all the, the, the leaves of the cork oak tree, uh, it, it was to prevent certain moths. And certain moths lay nice little eggs. And these eggs hatch, and they, they form nice little larvae, and they bore holes in the cork. And so it reduces the quality of the cork. Uh, and uh, just an aside, that's why uh, you people have capsules on bottles of corked wine. Well, initially, well, that now is part of the packaging. But initially, it was there because in your old cellars, uh, musty and all sorts of things, uh, there were moths. And the, the moths actually did lay their eggs in the cork, in the bottle, and would drill holes in the cork. So, so if you had a capsule over it, then, then uh, you prevent them from laying their eggs on the cork. Um, Okay, uh, so the pesticide was sprayed on the trees. Uh, it's uh, PCP, pentachlorophenol. Uh, pretty good uh, pesticide. Of course, these chlorine compounds do hang around a long time, uh, but it was basically on the surface. Uh, fungi have an interesting property. Some of them, they can actually detoxify the pesticide that they have a methylating enzyme. And uh, the bottom side uh, over on the right shows uh, what tends to happen. You have the pentachlorophenol, and uh, it's methylated at the top. But really intriguing thing is it actually removes two chlorines. <laughs> now, that's a damn good trick for any microbe to, to actually dechlorinate a compound. But uh, that, that's Presumably where most of the uh, TCA came from is that route. Uh, there are other possible routes, and that's associated with the bleaching agent that they used to use, which is hypochlorite. It's chlorine uh, compound. It can soak into the cork, especially if it has fissures. It can start to react with phenols in the cork. So you can get some chlorophenols actually produced and uh, that they can be uh, modified actually to TCA. So, so uh, that, that's one of the reasons why uh, they essentially do not any uh, longer use hypochlorite to bleach, and they've gone to peracetic acid. Uh, one, one of the sad things about uh, what people have started to know about TCA is that even though it has very, very low threshold, uh, even below threshold level, it can affect the character of the wine. Uh, it can actually mask certain uh, odors in the wine, and basically the fruity ones. And that's what you do not want to have masked. And then this can go down to very low concentration, which is dead disappointing. But uh, since uh, Europe banned uh, the uh, 
these chlorophenol pesticides back in late early 90s. Uh, and because the tree is stripped essentially every nine to 15 years, essentially the new cork uh, that's now being on the market ideally shouldn't have TCA, theoretically. Uh, okay, well, we have problems about oxidation. How much should be getting into the wine? Well, oh, boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about it. Uh, a real contentious issue. How much oxygen should get in? Um, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if anybody knows. I think it will vary with the type of wine, the type of style that you want, and uh, how many, all these other factors. But. Uh, the one at the top, uh, uh, that they're all, uh, well, let's see, try and remember. Can you read it? Uh, once. Uh, okay. There are the technical corks, the agglomerate corks. The agglomerate cork is actually pretty good at keeping out uh, oxygen. Uh, all the types are really, really pretty good. Uh, the ones, the, the center one, uh, that's your synthetic cork. Ooh, <laughs> not so good. Uh, if the wine is consumed within a year or two, no big deal. But uh, it certainly does get in. Uh, and then the bottom one shows natural cork. And uh, there are various grades of cork. There's uh, collimated cork and so on. Uh, there's a lot of variation there. And that, that's one of the issues of concern potentially, uh, assuming you know how much oxygen you want in or don't want in, is that uh, you really are not 100% sure what's going to happen in a particular bottle because of the variability of the cork. Uh, the uh, illustration on the uh, left-hand side. <laughs> yeah, that's left. <laughs> I have to look west to know what, which is right and left. Uh, don't ask me why, but <laughs> well, those strange uh, things. Uh, the, the red line shows uh, the compounds that can easily react with oxygen. And with time, sure, they go down. And uh, the blue line is the, um, uh, the amount of oxygen. It goes down um, because it's being consumed. Uh, and then slowly you see it starting to rise again. That's because of, uh, the compounds that are going to consume it are basically gone. And then now you get uh, oxygen coming in so it can start to build up. Uh, and uh, here's the uh, result of, uh, of a series of tests that were done in uh, Australia back several years ago. And uh, uh, really a nice illustration color one. Uh, the one on the right, or left, <laughs> uh, is your screw cap. And uh, the, the top row, that's uh, after two years and two months. Uh, the middle one is five years and three months, and the bottom is 10 years and five months. And you can see the browning reaction that people uh, seem to be concerned about. Uh, at times, I wonder if this is a really big issue, uh, because uh, when I talk to consumers, I've never heard anybody ever complain about the color of the wine. The, if it's kind of a little yellowy, so what? Um, but uh, it's at least to winemakers, it's of concern. And then, then uh, from uh, the top over, you have some natural cork and collimated cork, uh, longer ones, shorter ones. And then over, as further you go over, uh, you get into a synthetic, a range of synthetic corks. And so you can see that the synthetic corks are allowing far more oxygen in, and so you're getting browning. 
and uh, the screw cap that does a pretty good job in keeping it uh, with its natural coloration. Uh, so there's issues, how much oxygen, good, bad, and so on. Uh, then we have, uh, if you uh, seal your body, your bottle too much, what happens if you have really low oxygen uh, for a long period of time? And of course, you start getting into potential issues of reduced odors, uh, which are basically due to hydrogen sulfide, disulfide, or captan, and now potentially uh, polysulfanes. Uh, that's a, a new one that's popped up with the polysulfanes, which has a uh, struck uh, match flint kind of odor. Uh, and uh, so there's, uh, it's really hard to say, uh, there's a lot of literature, oh boy, uh, lots and lots of literature. Uh, it used to be thought it was primarily uh, an issue with Sauvignon Blanc. I guess that's where they, they first found it. And uh, Sauvignon Blanc does have a number of odors, uh, aromatic compounds in there that are thiol compounds. And uh, the, the, one of the classic ones is said it's supposed to smell like uh, cat piss. <laughs> uh, I've tried Samuel Blois since I don't have a cat and I don't know what, what the subtle pleasures of uh, the smell of cat piss happen to be. Uh, maybe I uh, have to get somebody to give me a sample so I can learn uh, what, what this wonderful odor is. Some people, uh, it tastes easy. I said, well, some people say there's a bit of cat piss smell in here. And they say, oh, yeah, 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 I detect that. Well, good. Uh, there, another one of the compounds is supposed to smell like uh, passion fruit. And I'm really passionate about passion fruit. And uh, I love this room. Oh, boy, I'm crazy about it. And it's supposed to be there. But I've never detected any passion fruit in my Sauvignon Blanc. But uh, anyway. Um, because of these style, they thought maybe that was uh, the issue. But then Riesling, oh, they found it in Riesling, and then they found it in Shiraz. Well, uh, yeah, you're not going to talk about uh, that, that in uh, those. So where do these odors come from? Uh, there are a whole host of potential sources. Uh, uh, you, if you're getting the... Uh, uh, Mercaptans, uh, now that's the blue side, uh, they can come from uh, amino acids uh, and other uh, thiol compounds in the wine. Uh, they, they can slowly break down and you could produce uh, mercaptans there. And uh, that tends to occur under very low oxygen conditions. And hydrogen sulfide can be produced and broken down by various reactions. Again, I just put this as to show the complexity of the issue. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, promote uh, any one side. It's it just it's a really complex issue. And uh, uh, here's a graphic. Uh, the two ones that I, I know for sure, because the paper doesn't say what, uh, closure A, closure B, C, D, E, R. They're really, really disappointing. They, they didn't even say what they were, uh, other than some were commercial and some weren't. But the blue ones, at least, uh, we have one with screw cap and one which is cork. And uh, the scale is actually uh, consumer acceptance or appreciation of the wine. And so the, the first lot, uh, you, you find that screw cap and natural cork come out pretty much the same. Another group of people, they thought the screw cap, uh, they, they didn't like the one that was in screw cap, but they liked the one that was in cork. Another group, <laughs> they liked the one in the screw cap and didn't like the one that was in the natural cork. <laughs> well, 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 what do you do? <laughs> uh, you're going to be damned almost uh, any way you go, and, or blessed either way you go. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, 
if you just look at the black uh, one, which is, uh, you can see it's the one that has the reduced, uh, you have black and red. The black is an ampule. I mean, you know there's no oxygen getting in there. And then the red is a screw cap with the tin. Uh, there's another red one, but you see it's almost the same as all the others. Uh, so some of them are a natural cork, uh, some of them are uh, a glomerate cork, uh, and so they're, they're all pretty much the same. And so, so uh, the one that uh, doesn't have the tin lining is the one that seems to fit everything else, at least in this particular experiment. And uh, summary? Okay. Um, is there a clear choice of which one uh, anybody should go for? The answer is, I think, no. Uh, there are some will be better in some situations, others. How do you find that out? To me, the only way, if you read all the literature, you just, oh boy, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's up to the winemaker to really decide himself. Uh, with their particular situation. If they try a number of options and just see over a few years what happens and what they like, that then uh, make a, a better choice. Because uh, as far as everything that I've read, it seems to vary with the cultivar, the style of wine. In some cases, like in parts of Spain, you can't even use, you have to use corn. So that's it. <laughs> Uh, so that's a legal constraint, uh, aging potential and uh, everything else. Or uh, you pay your money or you, you take your choice. Uh, <laughs> there, there you are. Uh, you're peeking through, you're trying to get a clear picture, but in fact, uh, even now, the literature will not give you a, a perfectly clear picture of which way to go with. Um, so it's sad that we, we can't be definitive, but uh, well, that's the way things are in most of life. Uh, there's no real 100% answer. And so uh, uh, I do have a couple other things that, that, that uh, I know I should because essentially my time's up. So, so we'll cut her off. Thank you, Ron. So we do have time uh, for questions. I'd like to start if there's any questions from uh, people in the live audience uh, here. And then uh, if there's, uh, once we're finished with our questions, I'll invite the online attendees to, uh, to answer questions. So uh, floor is open for, for Ron to answer your questions. Yeah, I think you're a lot of good to talk. I'm going to be a devil's advocate as, as usual. There's a suggestion, and I'll probably start with, that all core producers should be burned at the stake very slowly. And the reason why I say that is they've had millennia, literally, to produce a sound, reliable product, and they have 5 to 7 percent core paint rate, which is yeah. very recently has been the suggested average. That's on the table of account suboptimal effects, sub threshold effects. To me, it's, it's, it's horrible. I can't think of any closure or packaging in any other part of the food industry where that, that defect rate would be so acceptable. So, uh, my, my question is this why, why aren't we all moving towards screw caps? We now have functional liners in mm -hmm. which one can um, mimic and, in fact, improve upon the O2 uh, um, eliciting uh, properties that cause price. Uh, I think most winemakers now that use screw caps have adjusted their sulfides so we don't see the same uh, reduced character. So I guess my rhetorical question is why as educators aren't we educating the consumer on the merits of screw cap, the evils of natural core, and in so doing it allow the industry to actually uh, en masse uptake these, uh, these superior model products? Uh. Uh, I know that the cork industry was 
very loath to accept that they were uh, implicated in the, the, the court team. And it took them a long time to, uh, to, to accept that. And that really allowed uh, all other options to start to come in. And uh, now it's a real fight for them uh, to get back. And well, since they cannot guarantee uh, except with a conglomerate court, uh, certain quality standards, it's, it's tradition uh, for, for a lot of people. They say, well, if it doesn't come in the court, then it can't be any good. But admittedly, that is changing. And uh, some of the Australians have really taken on this issue and that they've studied it over 20, 25 years, and Penfold took some of their best wines, put it in screw cap, and they say, gee, it's such great, uh, after 20, 25 years. So, so uh, uh, when, when it comes to consumers, I, I don't know what you're gonna do. <laughs> it's just slow, slow process to uh, train them. I guess it's a, it's a good plug for our new consumer behavior now that, uh, that we're, we're about to open uh, for the summer. So I can see we'll have lots of research projects uh, uh, on the going in the future. Any other uh, questions from the group? Rana, the, I have a question. Do we have a sense, um, like in worldwide wine production, the percentage roughly that's still cork versus Moving to uh, the latest one that, that I saw, and I can't remember the date when, when it came out, uh, it was still in the range of about 75% cord. Mm, wow. Still, still high. Still high. So that, that uh, consumer driving factor uh, se seems to still be a, a huge component here. Right. Well, when you look at uh, France, Spain, and Italy being the biggest producers, they're still predominantly court. Uh, when you go to Australia, okay, uh, it almost flipped around. Uh, California is kind of a mix. So. Interesting. Any other questions from the group? Uh, Rana, you had your hand up. Okay, so are there any questions from our online audience that hopefully we'll be able to pick up over the speaker? So if you turn your mic on and uh, uh, go ahead and, and ask your question, uh, we, we don't know ahead of time, so um, just speak loudly. Okay, so we doesn't sound like we have any. No. So with that, uh, please join me uh, once again in thanking Ron uh, for his presentation. And Ron, I have a little a little gift for you. A little, a little <laughs> And uh, also, just a reminder um, that our next uh, week's lecture on uh, February 12th is from Annette Nassuth. Uh, she's a Covey Fellow, a professor from the University of Guelph, and her lecture is entitled, Do Grapes Scream for Frost Tolerance? So I'm sure that's going to be an entertaining talk all about cold hardiness of, of grapevines. So we'll